Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy false prophets and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor as the labor progresses the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes as we get closer to jesus return all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense all of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time out of the Israel Hamas war and the assault on southern Gaza. UN officials are warning of a dire humanitarian situation as citizens flee to the border with Egypt. Israel says it's on the hunt for Hamas leadership in southern Gaza and that it's almost complete control of the north. But we're on the border with northern, northern Gaza here and we've heard the sound of ongoing battle here, heavy battle, not just bombardments but small arms fire. That would suggest that Hamas is coming into close quarters uh, with Israeli fighters. It is taking time to uproot Hamas from Gaza but with every day that passes, more civilians die. Israel says it's shifted its focus to southern Gaza. But this morning, battles in the north of the Strip are still raging. 104 IDF soldiers have now been killed in this ground operation. Hamas proving difficult to uproot from northern neighborhoods. Despite the offensive, Hamas still able to launch rockets. We saw Iron Dome intercepts over Tel Aviv this morning. And that is Iron Dome coming into action, taking out rockets from Gaza. There is no Iron Dome in Gaza, where more than 18,000 people have now been killed, according to Hamas. Khan Yunus, where thousands had sought refuge, now a battleground. ABC producer Sami Ziara is there. As you hear in the background, the exchange of fire, uh, the ground vision continue for the uh, five days. Sami has been forced to move his family 17 times since the war began. He's desperate to keep them alive. My concern only how, how to protect my family from the war. My kids, they consider me that I'm a shelter for, for them and I'm not. Nearly 85% of Gaza's 2.3 million people have been displaced, according to the United Nations, who say there's no safe place to flee. Now the World Health Organization is warning Gaza's health system is on its knees and collapsing. The Q80 hospital's emergency room now outdoors. In the heart of ravaged Gaza City, drone footage captures the Israeli flag standing against the ruins of Palestine Square. The IDF has no instructions to reoccupy. The goal is to dismantle and destroy Hamas and bring home the hostages. We begin with the war in Gaza where dozens more Hamas terrorists have surrendered to Israel amid intense fighting. The IDF says these surrenders are signs that Hamas is crumbling, but cautioned it's still far from over. Even so, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is calling it the beginning of the end for Hamas. Dozens more Hamas terrorists have surrendered. The videos show them stripped down to make sure they're not carrying any explosives or suicide belts. The IDF says these surrenders show Hamas is crumbling, but cautioned it's still far from the end. There are a great many terrorists who have surrendered there, and this is a significant thing because these are signs that terrorists who are in difficult strongholds have decided to surrender. This is a very important thing. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called out for more Hamas members to surrender. It will take more time. The war is in full swing, but this is the beginning of the end for Hamas. I say to the Hamas terrorists, it is over. Don't die for Sinwar. Surrender now. The UN General Assembly is scheduled to vote on a non-binding resolution demanding a ceasefire in Gaza. Netanyahu thanked the U.S. for its veto last Friday 
against a binding Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire. Other countries should also understand that it is impossible on the one hand to support the elimination of Hamas and on the other hand to call for an end to the war that will prevent the elimination of Hamas. New developments raise concerns of a widening war as Hezbollah increased its rocket fire into northern Israel over the weekend, and the Iranian-backed Houthis in Yemen threatened to block any ships carrying supplies to Israel. So we wanted to have a look right now at what's happening in the Middle East, and we can count upwards of some 87 hits against uh, U.S. forces serving in the region, and a lot of them come back to the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Who are they? Not a designated terrorist group because this administration removed them back in February of 2021. Their slogan, pretty predictable, death to America, death to Israel, curse the Jews. We've heard a lot about that right now. And the Houthis control about 80 percent of the country of Yemen. They've been fighting a civil war there for more than five years at the moment. Also, the country of Yemen, located down here in the southern stretch of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, is the poorest country in the Arab world. Well, what does that mean to the rest of the world? You've got the Suez Canal here coming to the Red Sea. You, th you see these commercial uh, freight liners, right? You've got a choke point down here in Yemen. You've got another choke point over here in the Strait of Hormuz that leads in the Persian Gulf. And look what country is located there. That is Iran. And as we know, Iran has significant influence throughout the entire region. They've got influence in Syria, Lebanon, We've seen it in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, and certainly they have influence down here in Yemen. So what will we do about it? So far, not much. General Jack Keane joins us. And General, good morning to you on a Monday. I think the answer is pretty clear. As of today, this administration will not take action against the Houthis in Yemen. Do you disagree? They've issued sanctions against them. They're likely going to continue to use escorts to protect the commercial shipping in the area. Certainly, we're taking defensive action you know, to protect our ships, and Israel's taking action to protect itself. But clearly, that, that has been inadequate. We all can see it. Uh, your board reveals it. What has to be done is we have to go on offense, and we have to escalate. We have to uh, take the risk to escalate to gain some dominance, not just over the Houthis, but over Iran, who's using all of their proxies in the region to weaken Israel, that's what Hamas and Hezbollah is all about, and also eliminate it as a nation state eventually. The Houthis are part, part of that, and it's certainly the Iranian uh, backed Iraqi proxies and Syrian proxies, as well as the Houthis, want to drive the United States military presence out of the region. We have to recognize that Iran is calling the shots here, and we have to escalate also to give them the warning that we're not going to tolerate that and take some military action against something that they value. Israeli airstrikes are blamed for this. Major destruction in a residential neighborhood in a frontline village in Lebanon. Its biggest bombardment in the 10-week conflict along the border. Much of the area is empty as tens of thousands of people have fled the daily exchanges between Hezbollah and the Israeli army prompted by the war on Gaza. Recently, Israel's strikes have intensified. And the Lebanese armed group is using more powerful weapons in its attacks on Israeli military outposts and soldiers. The United Nations peacekeeping mission is raising the alarm. As I said, over the weekend, there has been a large number of, uh, of shelling. Also, one of our uh, base was hit, the watchtower in one of the Spanish uh, compound, likely no injuries. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, the longer this conflict continues and uh, there is an increase in the possibility of a, of a wider conflict. Despite the frequent exchanges, which have led to casualties on both sides, the violence is largely limited to the border area. But Israel is warning of a wider conflict if Hezbollah doesn't withdraw. In a show of force, Israeli warplanes fly over the Lebanese capital, Beirut. The Israeli military says if Hezbollah doesn't respond to diplomacy, it will have to impose a new reality to make Israelis feel safe to return to their homes in the north. There's a lot of uncertainty, but what is clear is that Hezbollah won't back down until Israel's war on Gaza ends. And all the while, tension is mounting on this front. 
In 2011, the Obama administration helped create the world's newest country, South Sudan. Susan Rice, UN ambassador at the time, visited with a high-profile delegation months before the inauguration. Two years later, South Sudan fell into civil war, killing 400,000 people. It was a country that was midwife by the United States. Since then, no single election has taken place in the country. Peter Ajak, an opposition leader from South Sudan, living in exile in the U.S., warns his country's oil, gold and diamonds are now being used to fund the war in Ukraine, serving as Vladimir Putin's personal ATM. South Sudan has started turning toward Russia. At the U.N. General Assembly in September, South Sudan's president, who oversees a fiefdom of corruption, was looking for weapons. We call upon the United Nations to lift the arms embargo imposed on us. He flew straight to Moscow after the U.S. refused his request to meet with President Biden. Since then, a number of Russian operatives have arrived in the country. This country that was born on the promise of democracy is now essentially becoming uh, a, a puppet of the Russian regime. As we can plainly see, Russia is now adding parts of Africa, along with Iran and Turkey, forming the coalition of nations that will seek to destroy Israel in the last days, spoken of by the prophet Ezekiel, and I believe it is happening right before our very eyes. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17, 1 and 14, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17, 9. In that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow, and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. Jeremiah 49, 34 through 37. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is Bashar nuclear reactor located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. There is a prophecy written by Asaph the seer that many end-time teachers believe has yet to find fulfillment. In this prophecy, a confederation of Muslim nations have taken crafty counsel against the Jewish people in Israel in order to destroy them as we read in Psalm 83, 1-8. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Ezekiel 38, 1-9 the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, 
Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his hordes, Bethgarma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 who will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin the infamous Gog of Magog? that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. We are going to begin with a wave of dangerous weather, a horrific weekend, unfortunately. Tornadoes in Tennessee, six people killed, entire neighborhoods wiped out, and that same massive system is now flooding parts of New York, New Jersey, and southern New England. Hours of heavy rainfall fell overnight there. So let's go first, though, to Manuel Bohorquez in Nashville, Tennessee, 
where Tennessee's governor has already declared a state of emergency. Those who survived the storms are now contending with below freezing temperatures. At last check, more than 20,000 customers in this area were still without power, and temperatures have dipped into the mid-20s, so getting people access to heat, authorities say, is a priority. In Nashville, Tennessee, videos posted to social media show the intense wind. Oh my God. And the night sky lit up from exploding electrical equipment. Oh! A transformer just blew. In just minutes, powerful tornadoes shredded homes in Middle Tennessee. The city of Clarksville was hardest hit, where the National Weather Service says an EF3 tornado reached max wind speeds of 150 miles per hour. Yet closer to Nashville, an EF2 tornado left its mark as it sent mobile homes airborne at this trailer park. Firefighters believe that's how 31-year-old mother Floridima Perez and her two-year-old son Anthony Mendez were killed. One of the firemen, I said, did they find the baby? And they said, yes, they couldn't find it because she was holding it, covering it, protecting it. Another trailer belonged to 37-year-old father, Joseph Dalton, who died from his injuries. I'm thankful that we're all alive, but what hurts me more than anything, he lost his life last night. The National Weather Service reported at least six tornado tracks. Officials say at least 22 structures were destroyed and more than 80 people were injured. I hope nobody lives in those houses. Tennessee Governor Bill Lee toured the damage Sunday. There are victims whose lives are devastated and will never be the same. Tanya Osborne says she's lucky she wasn't home when her house was hit. I would have been in the closet that's now been sucked out. Now she's left with very little. My whole life has been reduced to several garbage bags and what I can get in them and what I can salvage. Really sad, really heartbreaking. Felipe Domingo lost his wife and his two-year-old son. Sad, this is great. Telling us their loss has left him with a big pain in his heart. The tragedy, part of a storm system that produced over 20 tornadoes across the south. Now that same system is moving up the east coast, putting 52 million people under flood alerts from D.C. to Maine, prompting another brief tornado in North Carolina. Back in Clarksville, Tennessee, Markeisha Frazier says a tornado pulled her home apart while her entire family was inside. The wind just took me, and I just remember waking up on this side of my house looking for my home, and then I saw my children over there, and my husband was in the debris back there. Families here now trying to salvage what they can as the community promises to work together to rebuild. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? We live in a world full of pain and suffering. There is no one, including Christians, who are not affected by the hard realities of life. The question, why do bad things happen to good people, is one of the most difficult questions in all of theology. God is sovereign, so all that happens must be allowed by Him, if not directly caused by Him. We must understand that human beings cannot expect to fully understand God's thoughts and ways as we read in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In the book of Job, Job was a righteous man, yet he suffered in ways that none of us can even imagine, as we read in Job 1.1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. God allowed Satan to do everything he wanted to Job, except kill him, and Satan did his worst. What was Job's reaction? Job's reaction was to trust God and to bless him. Job 121, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 1315, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Job didn't understand why God had allowed the things he did, but he knew God was good and therefore continued to trust in him. That should be a believer in Jesus' reaction as well. As hard as it is to acknowledge, we must admit to ourselves that we are sinners and there are no good people, as we read in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even on your best day, we are like filthy rags, as we read in Isaiah 64.6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, 
and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Bad things may happen to good people in this world, but this world is not the end. Christians have an eternal perspective, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Bad things happen to good people, but God uses those bad things for good, as we read in Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Bad things happen to good people, but those bad things equip believers for deeper ministry, as we read in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Bad things happen to good people, and the worst things happen to the best person. Jesus is the only truly righteous one, yet he suffered more than we can imagine, and we should follow in his footsteps, as we read in 1 Peter 2, 20-23. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Romans 5.8 declares, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Despite our sinful nature, God still loves us. God loves the world so much that He sent His only begotten Son to die for us, as we read in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God allows things to happen for a reason. Whether or not we understand His reasons, we must remember that God is good, just, loving, and merciful. Psalm 135.3 Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. Bad things happen to us that we simply cannot understand. Instead of doubting God's goodness, our reaction should be to trust him. As we read in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation. Repentance unto salvation 
does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.